This is David Shipman with the Baby Mind Project, and you're listening to Your Beautiful Day on the Gratitude Radio Network. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the special simulcast of Your Beautiful Day on the Gratitude Radio Network and also Neil Haley's show that's syndicated on 150 plus stations all over the world. And I'm excited to welcome the program my two co-hosts, Jen Mogg and Pearl Sharenza. But Jen, I am excited about our guest today. And how are you doing, Jen? Hey, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone listening. We appreciate you all watching our show and following our journey. We want to thank you. And we hope that you're having a day of gratitude and that we can enhance that for you. I'm doing really good. And I love our, I, I'm so excited about this because I grew up, of course, like a lot of people going to the circus and um, I'm a little ready for our guests because it's, it's I, I couldn't get ringmaster wear, but I got Bush Gardens and I'm, you know, I've got my, my stripes on for my tiger stripes. So I'm kind of, I'm in, I'm close to a circus mode, but Pearl, how are you doing? Hey, everybody. I am doing awesome. I'm so excited for today um, because I grew up loving the circus. And um, I actually, funny thing is I told my husband a funny circus story last night that I have um, that I would love to share with David. But anyways, I'm excited to be here. It's good to be back. And Neil, having you back on, we've been away too long. So I'm going to send it off back over to Neil. Well, away just one week because we had an amazing guest. We recorded. I was off for a week because of certain uh, things. But again, after we had Deandra, I love this guest. And uh, so I'll just go right start really a question for David before, you know, the, the pandemic. Let's just jump right off to growing up. Tell us a little bit about David, where you grew up and a little bit about you. Sure. First of all, thanks so much for having me here this morning, you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to chat with you guys. Um, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, which is my hometown. And uh, I grew up loving music. Um, and what's really, what's really interesting is my favorite thing in this world is a tone deaf person with conviction. And that's kind of what my family is. So no one else really has vocal abilities aside from like maybe a really fun karaoke night. Um, but I grew up singing in the Pensacola Children's Chorus and, and that really instilled uh, a passion of performing for me. I, we, we would perform twice a year, a spring show and a Christmas show. Uh, we performed all over the world. We performed at the White House a few times for a few different presidents. Uh, and it really just kind of cemented in my mind that, I mean, performing was such a, a wonderful thing and uh, I wanted to do it for as long as I could. And it's been a really, it's been a really interesting journey to where I am now. Wow. All right, Jen, first question for David. Thank you, thank you. Um, so David Shipman, how did you get started and in going into, in, into the circus and before then? And I, I appreciate Tone Deaf because I grew up with Jimmy Buffett music. So, <laughs> uh, so I always my, thought I could sing his songs, you know. Who says you can't? Who says I can't? <laughs> <laughs> so my journey to the circus was actually really interesting. Um, my very first memory is of the day that my sisters, my twin sisters were born. And I was a bit of a difficult child, if you can imagine. And my, my parents didn't want me running around the hospital, messing things up at the hospital. So they told my godparents to take me to the circus so that I could run around and mess things up at the circus. Uh, and so my very first memory, because I knew how important that day was, was, uh, was at a Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. And I remember the lights and the colors and the mm -hmm. horses and the ringmaster. Um, and it, that was really something that was so transcendent for me because I knew even from that age, I was two and a half years old, um, just how exciting that was. And then I started performing with the children's chorus and performing all over the world and, you know, middle school, high school, college. Um, then life happened. And uh, when, I, when, I, when I graduated college, I decided I was going to get a big boy job. It was time to grow up and, and get a big boy job. So I was an admissions counselor for an art and design college. And for many years, I would tell students who are coming in that life begins at the end of your comfort zone, take risks, take chances, live boldly. 
And then I, re- I realized one day that I wasn't following my own advice. I was a big hypocrite. And I thought, if I'm going to tell these people to live boldly, then I should at least follow by, I should lead by example. So I left my job on a whim and I decided that I was going to do that year that I was going to do everything that scared me. And the more it scared me, the more I had to do it. I was going to take every risk I could, I, you know, from a, from a, you know, from a responsible perspective, right. uh, I was going to just put myself out there. And I was playing on Facebook one day and uh, I was scrolling past an audition notice on Central Florida auditions because I was living in Orlando at the time. And it was, it was a post from a company that was asking for a touring host. Didn't say anything about it. It just said touring host must be young, uh, charismatic and can dance. And I am two of those three things. I can't dance, but I can, but I was young and I, you know, I was, I was charismatic, uh, but I missed the audition by like a week and a half. And so I almost scrolled past it. And I thought to myself, what's the worst that can happen? You know, like take this risk, who knows what's going to come of it. And so I scrolled back up to the audition post and sent off my headshot and resume. And I said, I know you guys probably found someone you had auditions all over the world for this post. So don't feel bad if it's a no, but I just wanted to maybe next year, if you're looking for someone, keep me on file. And an hour later, they called me and invited me to a private audition with the owners of the company. And basically on the spot, they offered me a contract to run away with the circus. And uh, it was with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, which was my first memory and uh, which was really exciting. And my, one of my very first performance, I got performances. I got to perform in the same arena that I saw it in when I was two. So it was this really fun full circle moment in my career. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. That's that's such a cool story. And I love the part just to back up where you said, if I'm going to tell these students that are coming here to me that you got to live boldly and live outside, I got to live lead by example. And so many times in our life, you know, we'll have even our parents got to do this, this and this, but you look at them and going, but you're not doing that. Right. So Yeah. So how cool is that? Have you gone back? Like have any of the students you've talked to before to help, have you reached any of them reconnected with you through now what you're doing and stepping out boldly? That's a great question. No, no one's ever asked me that question before. And and yes, uh, I stay in touch with several of them who have gone off and achieved dreams of their own. Uh, And it's really fun to be able to say like, even though I, we had a different trajectory, I, we both started in one place and developed into mm-hmm. something really exciting. And we did that by being bold and taking risks and taking chances, which everyone should do. I can't recommend it enough. And see, that's such an important thing because what we run on, into sometimes, David, is that we miss out on opportunities when we're not willing to get out of our comfort zone. If we, when we want to try to be safe. And David, I think when you did that, how much more was your life more fulfilling once you chose that? It opened up so much. I think something that I really took away from living boldly and living as, as uh, outside of my comfort zone as possible is that so often we put ourselves in a box because of the perception of other people. We think, oh, I won't get that job or, oh, I won't get at this audition or, you know, oh, this person won't date me because we project a perception onto them without giving them the chance to make a perception of their own. So we we put ourselves in these boxes. And when you stop thinking about how someone will perceive you and just let them perceive you, it allows you to, to expand yourself, be outside of your box and to be receptive to anything that comes your way. That's well done. Cool. Thanks. What a powerful story. Have you written a book about your life yet? Uh, so not yet. Uh, I, uh, there's a the great kid's little kids book i would love to write with you or something exactly your story because kids are so impressionable and it all it seems like we have all of these gifts when we're little and we have so much spirituality when we're little and then we're told no 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 and as an adult it seems you know like going off with the circus it it works in my wheelhouse but you know But for some people that are accountants, it's not like what they wanted to do when they were three. Nobody says at three o'clock, you know, two or three or four, I can't wait to get my cubicle when I get older. Nobody, nobody says that, but everybody says, oh, of course, we want to run away with the circus. What was one of the best moments that you had in the circus? Like your gratitude moment of everything was just like, oh, this is the life. So that's a great question. And there are two, it's twofold. Um, 
I mentioned that I saw my first Ringling Brother Circus when I was two and a half years old. And I have this mm -hmm. picture of me. Um, and I'm, I have platinum blonde hair and a bowl cut. And, uh, and I, did the, I did a performance for Ringling about a thousand times, a little over a thousand times. I was a, a ringmaster and had a thousand performances. And um, everyone always asks, how do you keep it new? How do you keep it fresh? How do you not make it stagnant? Uh, and I would always, I had the position every show to look out into the audience and see all of the kids before the lights came on. They couldn't see me, but I could see them. And I would always look for him and he was always there. And I would find a two or three year old boy with platinum blonde hair and a bowl cut, just super excited to be with his family at an event. And I would project all of my energy towards his moment and maybe a memory that he would take with him for the rest of his life. Like I took mine with me. It wasn't about me. It was about their memories and how they could yeah. connect and grow with their families, because that's something that transcend that that's why they said children of all ages, because whether you're four years old or 94 mm -hmm. years old, you have this wonderful connection to it. Um, and that was really powerful for me. Um, there was also a, a moment, uh, which I'll segue into a different story. There was a, we did a lot of outreach with children. And as we'll talk about, I love working with children. It has always been my passion. And there was a little boy, uh, we were doing an, an event for foster kids and their families. And there was this little boy, and he was in a wheelchair. Um, and he was being a little bit difficult. You know, he was about three or four years old. Um, and he was everybody else was lifting weights. They were, um, you know, trying on costumes. They were engaging with their foster families. And we were trying to create these scenarios in which they could build memories and build relationships and like grow together as a unit. And he was just sad. Um, and I remember at one point I walked over to his mom, foster mom, and I said, hey, would you mind if I just like tried something? I don't know if it will work, but let me just try. And she said, okay, do what you got to do. And so I asked him, I said, would it be okay if I picked you up? And he kind of nodded his head really quickly. So I picked him up and um, I had a couple of the other performers come over with me and we had a low wire, which was like a high wire, but it was low enough for people to walk on. And I kind of cleared the room and made sure that no one was around. And I held him up and the other performers moved his legs in a walking formation on a low <laughs> wire. And he was so, like, he was really confused. He didn't know what was happening. And he looked down and he looked up and he looked down and he looked up and then he looked down. And I, because I was holding him, I could feel his chest expand and he gasped. And then he just started crying and started reaching out to anybody who would look um, to see that he was walking. And he, he made me go back and forth and back and forth on this low wire. And it was, I mean, everybody was crying and it was really emotional. And when I handed him uh -huh. back to his mother and, back in her sit in her chair she said we just collectively as a unit we just want to let you know that these kids don't come from places with a lot of smiles and this is the smile that he'll carry with him for a very long time Forever. that moment that i realized that there were so many things that we had the opportunity to build upon with the platform that mm -hmm. we had and that right. what we created allowed me to be where i am now because of that one moment so I have to say from a mom who has been blessed from adoption and sure. somebody who's been very involved. I mean, when I, when you, when Neil shared this, I went like right away researching. I was like, okay. And with that story you just shared, I, I've helped a charity here locally for foster families. And mm -hmm. I mean, I just got chills. I could just see the, you painted that picture. Mm -hmm. I could just see him and, and being around kids like him that I've been around to, to see that. And, and I feel your passion and I'm trying to hold back tears and, and, and the, and why you're doing what you're doing. So let's go into that because I love what you're doing. And like, I've already shared it to like about 25 of my friends and five of my ambassadors. So let's, I would love to lead us down that path. Like what brought you there? Share the story. I know the story cause I kind of went researching, but share with the listeners that story. Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. Uh, I think it's wonderful that you adopted. And I think that especially because about where we're about to go, it'll, it'll all make sense. But mm -hmm. I, I love that you did that and you were able to. So um, right after that moment happened, I decided that I wanted to do something more. So I, I built a show. I got I'd help, I'd help, a lot of help, but I, we created a show that could fit inside of children's hospitals so that the kids who were not able to come to see the circus could still run away with the circus for an afternoon and just be kids. 
and uh, we had music and contortionists. And sometimes the hospitals would allow us to bring in hyperallergenic poodles um, so the kids could like just laugh and be kids. And um, Feld Entertainment, who owns Ringling Brothers, uh, got behind it and they donated several million dollars to the project. And so every week we were in a different children's hospital. They donated between 10 and $20,000 to the pediatric oncology department of that hospital. Um, and it was an incredible gift uh, to be able to go into so many children's hospitals because I was so impassioned by it. We went into a different children's hospital every single week for three years. I made it my, my mission for, for me to, to achieve that. And we did. Um, and it was incredible. And um, in that, I, you know, we had to connect with the hospital. So there were promoters in different regions. And I, uh, I got a, a Facebook message, oh, all of this, I'm just realizing all of this somehow ties back to Facebook, my time with Ringling, this message that I got, that's fun. Um, but I got the <laughs> message from uh, one of the promoters and she was like, hey, I know how much you adore kids. I know how much you love working with them. We, you should volunteer at this orphanage in Uganda that a friend of mine works for. Mm. And I had always thought about going to Africa. I'd done some, some work uh, when I was younger, kind of, in that area. Um, and I'd, I'd always wanted to, not in Africa, but I'd, I had some friends who had gone and I'd always wanted to follow in their footsteps and life just got in the way. And so I thought, okay, I, I made the decision to transition away from Ringling because I had lived that dream and I wanted to start pursuing new dreams that I got to create while I was there. And so I thought, okay, now I have this time, I have this flexibility, let me see what I can accomplish. So I, um, I reached out to this organization and uh, I was placed in a little village called Kaihura um, in, in, in Uganda. And I had never been out of America before, but I knew I needed to go uh, because we had uh, a few days before I had been placed, uh, I, got a, we were, I was playing a card game with some friends and everybody had put the card game away. And there was one like wayward card that had fallen out of the pack. And I went to pick it up and put it back in. And when I read the name or when I read the word on the card, the card said hope. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting word. I don't know why I would pick that up, but I picked it up and I put it back in the deck. And a couple, like the next day, maybe, maybe even in that evening, I was talking to this organization and they said, we think that you would be a perfect fit at this um, elementary school, this primary school in this little village. It's called Hope Academy. Um, and so I booked my plane ticket that day. I had never, ever been out of America before. My mom thought I was crazy. Um, but I thought, live boldly. You have the time, you have the resources, just go. And I did many things while I was in Uganda. It was the best thing that could have happened to me. I thought that I was going to be meeting a team of people who were on the ground working, but it ended up just being me. Um, which was an interesting journey all in itself because when I got off the airplane, I was like, tell me about the team from America who's here. And he was like, what team? It's just you. Um, so that was terrifying, but you make it work. And it ended up being wonderful because instead of being told what I needed to do by a group of people, I got the best piece of advice I could have the day that I got there because I came in, I was nervous, I was excited, I felt, I felt all the emotions. And the, the, the head of the community pulled me aside and she said, hey, I know you're going through a lot right now. I know you've got a lot going on. Instead of coming in here and telling us what we need and how you're going to help us, why don't you just be quiet and listen and sit with us and then decide how we need help. And it was the best piece of advice I could have received because instead of projecting what I thought that they needed onto them, I got the piece of advice to listen to what they actually needed and then create a scenario around it. So I helped in the medical facility. I helped in the orphanage. I helped, um, I did a fundraising project where I raised $25,000 to build a protective barrier around the orphanage to protect children from very scary things that were happening over there. Mm -hmm. um, and but the, my favorite thing that I did was there was uh, this little boy who had, his name was Davis. Uh, and he, he had a very traumatic entrance into this world. And I was so moved by it that I thought to myself, I had this, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but I just had this overwhelming sense, this thought that before he knew how he entered the world and that the people who were supposed to protect him and love him 
did not. And before he knew how terrible it was, he needed to know love and support and comfort. That was irrefutable. He just needed to know it. And so I went over to the orphanage and I picked him up and I just started singing him lullabies after his, after he'd been fed. And I thought, this is simple enough. I don't have to raise any money to do this. It's something that I've been, that I've been, I've been singing since I was, you know, able to speak. Wow. So why not just sing to this little boy? Um, and what I quickly realized was that the children in the orphanage, specifically at Hope Academy and at the, the uh, Bringing Hope to the Family Orphanage, they'd never heard lullabies before. They would pick up their little blankets and pillows and they would come, they would waddle over to me and they would, they would put their pillows on the floor and they would just crowd around and listen to me as I was singing to this little boy, to, to Davis. Um, and we did that every day for months while I was there. And I started studying how the effect of music affected their social skills, how they slept, how they ate. Uh, and it was a wonderful thing that just came so second nature. We sing lullabies to kids over here and we never even think that other people may never know what that feels like. Um, so yeah, it was a, a wonderful journey. And now we've, we've got this really incredible project that we're working on. So it sounds like David, everything connected the dots. It did. involved working with them in the hospitals, then to the orphanage, then to Uganda, then you came up with the idea of the lullaby, and then, hello, this is where you are today. So that journey, probably you didn't think it was going to be that kind of journey, right? Uh, no. Who, I, no. <laughs> uh, I had no concept of knowing that this is where things would go. Um, and it's funny because, I, it again, it just comes – when I had this, this idea, so when I was holding Davis and I was singing him lullabies, I came back to the United States and I thought, okay, something that I really want to do is create a lullaby album. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I had this idea in my head. I thought what's probably going to happen is this, I'm just going to raise, I'm going to do a little fundraising project and I'm going to raise enough money for me to like sing karaoke tracks in a friend's garage and put it on a CD and like be done with it, right? Because it's just a lullaby album. But it just took on a life of its own. And we raised this money um, to, pu to put together this lullaby album. And we started a nonprofit organization called the Baby Mind Project. And we called it that for many reasons. But Baby Mind was actually one of the songs that I used to sing to the children as they were falling asleep, uh, which is the lullaby from Dumbo, which is circus and children uh, and lullabies. And so we called it the Baby Mind Project because it just had so many wonderful tie-ins. And we raised this money and decided that, um, that it, instead of it just being about one person, we wanted it to be a collective of, of all, a collection of all. And so we worked with children's choirs, which was a wonderful experience, but not anything that I really ever thought was going to happen in multiple countries in Africa. So specifically Uganda uh, with the African Children's Choir, uh, Kenya with the Kenyan Boys Choir and South Africa. So yes, it's very exciting. Um, there's a lot of representation on the album, which is wonderful because when children are falling asleep, they'll be able to be comforted by children on their continent. Um, and there's a lot of different languages that are represented and lullabies, specifically Tula Baba, which is a South African lullaby, which is a very soothing, comforting sound. But I wanted it to feel relevant enough for anyone in the world to be comforted by it. But I also wanted it to be uh, pinpointed enough so that if, a, if an, a child, an orphan child who was falling asleep was listening to it, they would hear sounds from their country or their continent. Um, and we, I, I spent a year, it was a, a very interesting year, but I spent a year developing how the, the progression of the album would go. Uh, my, I, I let my dad listen to a song and my dad said, it should go like this. I don't know why it doesn't go like this. It said descend. And I thought to myself, this means something, but I don't know what it means. And I woke up in the middle of the night one night and I thought, this is how the album should go. So we start with a lot of choirs and orchestrations and sounds so that it draws a child's attention in, mm -hmm. but then we slowly strip away um, all of the instrumentation, all of the choirs, all of the voices until it's just one person singing a cappella. So it follows the natural uh -huh. of how you're soothed into sleep. So there's nothing jarring. It's just really soft. And I was connected with a, uh, a woman in Africa, uh, Isahera, 
Uh, she works at the uh, OV Children's Hospital in Kenya. And we were connected through a wonderful connection of mine. I work a lot with UNICEF. And uh, I had a friend who said, you should connect with this woman. And so she owns and she opened a, a nonprofit organization. It's a, a children's hospital for orphan children in Kenya. Uh, and so I worked a lot with her. Uh, and I would send over samples of the music and have her play it for the kids to see how they would respond to it, how it soothed them, what needed to be tweaked. Uh, and then we put everything together to make it happen. And the proceeds, we've already created enough of a proceed to create a speaker system, which is both for safety and for comfort in the children's hospital, so that as the children in Kenya are falling asleep, they can actually hear the songs being played throughout the hospital, which is been a wonderful gift. So it all kind of becomes full circle because it started with children's hospitals and now children's hospitals internationally are being supported by this project. That is just like so amazing. I mean, it's just like to think about, like Neil said, all the the dots are connecting and, and all of it coming together. It's mm -hmm. just what a what a gift. Your um your your folks have to be so proud of you. I mean, what you've done. I mean, I'm a mom. I'd be like, if my sons came home to that, I'd be like, wow, you know, I, that's my son, you know? So, um, what, what happens next? So you, you're back here in the state. So now what happens next for, for the charity and then what happens next for you? So we put together, uh, we, we've released the album. We are fingers crossed. We did a full four year consideration campaign for the Grammys. Uh, so we're hoping that we'll be nominated for the best children's album uh, this year. Um, so we're hopeful for that, but we're moving forward with new projects. We released a really adorable kind of clothing line for uh, like merchandise for kids. Uh, and similarly to the Lullaby album, 50% of the proceeds go towards benefiting the health and wellness of children in mm -hmm. remote areas of Africa. Um, so we've got all these really exciting things planned. Uh, we're creating a second album because this is the first volume of many. Um, and so we're, we're kind of back. We took a little bit of break from it because we spent two years developing it and we needed a little bit of separation from it to get some more clarity on the second volume. But now we have some really exciting ideas in regards to what should come next. And we will continue to develop the projects that will not only benefit them financially, but also benefit them from a safety and comfort perspective. Because when I built the album, not only did I focus on how it would descend, but I knew that it was going to go to orphaned children. So I specifically stayed away from parenting messages of mm -hmm. I'm your mom, I'm your dad, and instead focused on you're safe, you're brave, and you are not alone. And those are messages that anybody can relate to in any concept um, anywhere in the world, especially right now with COVID. So this music right. can help everyone. Jen, what a gratitude moment. We're hearing a multiple gratitude moments, but I know you have a question for David regarding gratitude. Oh my gosh, that is a mother of gratitude. Um, it just pulls at my heartstrings because of, um, yeah, uh, I have a lullaby um, that I sung with, with Ryan and my daughter's 15 now. So she still, she still asks me to sing to her the mm. lullaby. They're so powerful. powerful. And I think it's amazing what you're doing, especially as simple as a lullaby simple and Thank the you. fact that they appreciate us in kenya they appreciate anything that happens that we're able to bring to them um i'd love to talk to you further about seeing what we can do with the gratitude radio network with with your undertakings what Thank are you. some of the things that you need for kenya so that's a great question. Um, you know, we we're constantly looking for, you know, shoes for kids, uh, mm -hmm. clothes, um, any kind of comforting teddy bears or the, like soft things. Um, we are, you know, if you go to the baby, if you go to babymindproject.org, you can find mm -hmm. ways to donate, to get involved uh, and to be as present there as you are here. Um, and I think that that's a really powerful thing is that music connects everybody uh, and, and by giving by purchasing the album not only are you providing music to the people that you already know and love through things that you know that are familiar to you but that but the money also goes towards benefiting children that you'll never get the chance to meet um, and that's a very powerful thing well David I can absolutely say that I've never said this before but this is a definite 
something that I've always wanted to say is that you are a father of gratitude. This is a father of gratitude <laughs> moment. Um, and that, yeah, we're kind of like parents to everyone. Sure. And growing up in Winter Park, growing up in Orlando, I always lived at Disney. So I always believed in it's a small world, yeah. you know, and I always loved Africa and African songs and, and that culture. Where do you want to go? Where do you see your charity going? So we would like to expand it into multiple countries where we're planning on uh, the, 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 the OV Children's Hospital is expanding into Bangladesh. So we're mm -hmm. going to be expanding with them. Uh, but we're looking at developing relationships with new children's hospitals, with new orphanages, uh, kind of all throughout Africa as the company continues to grow and brand itself. And we would like to be a, uh, on the forefront of creating scenarios of comfort and change for children who need it most. Um, and I think that we do that by starting, by starting small and growing. Uh, and it's been it's been really wonderful to watch it all kind of come together in this, as you guys have heard, this really exciting full circle moment. Um, and I, I'm excited to kind of see where it grows because so far, like I mentioned, I saw myself just recording an album in a, in a garage and to be here with it, it's taken on a life of its own. And so to watch it continue to grow, I'm really excited to see how it evolves. And the simplicity of a lullaby. And just the simplicity the that is love that is love mine is called my heart my heart loves you and your heart loves me too and it's yeah i, I sing it so i'll talk to you maybe we can do something with it ryan would love that my daughter um because it's one of those beautiful things so as i was saying where is your book to go with this for the kids <laughs> to read so we're actually it's funny that you say that we are actually talking right now to a um to a to a graphic designer and to an artist who are going to be potentially putting together content for uh, what we've already created or planning to create. Uh, and, you know, that to create a story time scenario in which kids are reminded to live boldly, to, to take risks and to be surrounded with hope. Because you're right, when you are young, you're full of creativity and imagination mm -hmm. and vigor for life and there's just this wonderful thing about about children that we lose somewhere along the way and mm -hmm. if we could if we could focus on on creating a way to to save that and to nurture mm -hmm. it instead of putting a thumb on it in a way that also benefits children at while they're growing i think that that would be the best of both worlds i love it thank you and thank you so much for being with us today how can um, our listeners and viewers reach you and help you? So we're everywhere, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can go to our website, babymindproject.org. You mm -hmm. can listen and stream it on Amazon, on Spotify. Type in baby, the Baby Mind Project Lullaby Collection. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's really wonderful. We debuted at number five on iTunes, which has been so great. And we really appreciate all the support and the continued support as you get more involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pearl? So David, I just want to, again, thank you so much. I think we've heard so much gratitude in, in everything you've been sharing with us today. And um, I know we'll, all of us will definitely get this out to our listeners and our friends and our family. And um, I'm, I'm really excited. I wrote down a lot of the different things you're saying. Um, but I think your book is called Living Boldly. I wrote that name down. That's your book, not the children's book. That's your book. It's called Living Boldly. So I would love to get with you on that. But again, thank you so much for sharing your story. And um, Neil, I'm going to hand it back to you so you can close us out. Or no, Jenna will close us out. But I mean, I just wanted to say, David, the story is just tremendous. But you just could see it just, you were led the whole way from that mm -hmm. Facebook message, decide to be part of the circus, to using that platform in front of all that audience to go to help the children's hospitals then to orphans and then to africa and then bringing it back full circle again one question is are there other are you considering ever being a ringmaster again is there no that's a good question i um you know i i don't know I'm, uh, the, the door is never closed to it i do think 
that when you are living a dream, when, when you're living the dream, what do you do? You create new dreams, right? Mm-hmm. So I lived this wonderful dream for a very long time and I'm grateful for it, but, but where this is going, I want to explore that more. So definitely not the door closed on, on being a ringmaster. That was a wonderful time in my life and I would love to explore it again, but I'm so keyed into the Baby Mind Project and the wonderful yeah. that's that's going. And it's, it's a story that you tell everyone, have you ever met a ringmaster before? And then the <laughs> conversation starts, and then that conversation leads to opportunity. But it looks like what you're doing with the, the, the project is becoming even bigger than your days in the ringmaster. So I mm-hmm. guess uh, you can always have that as a backstory in a conversation when you're meeting with somebody that's going to donate lots of money uh, to help your charity, but then go back to what you're doing now, which is just absolutely tremendous so that's all i have to say it's amazing uh the story and uh yeah we'll get it out everywhere we can and uh it's just such a it's a great thing and with the hospitals i have a connection with you one of my clients uh is is working with hospitals as well and she has a child with dwarfism that's a trick and it's an amazing story and she's getting her book into different hospitals so i think that you guys children's hospitals. I think you guys both need to connect and network. I'll connect you to to her. I would love that. I'm always a connector, David. That's what I try to do here whenever I get to interview people and I interview people all the time. And it's so much fun to learn. And I learned Mm -hmm. so much. So Jen, go ahead and close everything out. But David, fantastic stuff. And uh, I'm I'm very impressed for sure. Thank you guys again so much for having me. It's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you. All right, Jen. Go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. Well, whether you're a ringmaster and with Ringling Brothers or in your own life, remember you have to take risks, live boldly, live by example for the infinite possibilities as we've been talking with David Shipman. And you guys also go to babymindproject.org. Remember, you are blessed, you are loved, and you are sacred. I love you. Have a beautiful day.